Thank you, Grace and the team. So appreciate it. Love those songs. Love those songs. I want to encourage you, if you uh, will look at your uh, bulletins today, you'll notice that there is a sheet there uh, that has some blanks on it uh, to help you take some notes. There's also kind of an extended text on that. Um, you'll see that's a quote from the GAC version of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, the GAC is the Gregory Allen Kauser version uh, from 1. Uh, just so I wanted to uh, write that out in detail just for you to have as you think about the passage we're going to be in today. Um, we're coming to uh, a moment that the biblical uh, encouragement at the communion is a call to remember what Jesus did on the cross. It's a time of remembrance. And we're familiar with those. We're, we're going to read those. And here's Paul's communion directions that we often turn to. Matter of fact, that's the only uh, uh, passage within the New Testament that gives us an example of, of how the church, if you will, carried out communion uh, in obedience to what the Lord instituted at the Last Supper. You can find that referred to in the Gospels. And so Paul puts this here, and so we often read this, and it goes this way. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Uh, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, this new arrangement that God has made possible by virtue of God's death that allows us to be transformed uh, in the heart from the very core that imparts the spirit to us um, and writes the law on our hearts. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now we'll return to that as we take the elements, but the Lord's request, right, for his disciples to remember him by partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine has rich significance. Matter of fact, there are whole volumes just written on the implications of what it means to celebrate these two elements. But one of the things I just want you to think about here, that eating the elements helps us appreciate the fact that Christ is really united to us. Okay, think about this with me. That he's really united to us and us to him. Eating together reminds us of our unity with other believers in Christ's body, the church. Right, so the symbol of taking in these elements reminds us that there is a real, profound, eternal union between us and Jesus Christ. Right? Paul is famous for his little phrase of you are now in Christ. And so we're in connection with him in such a way that everything that is Christ's become ours. And we benefit from that. Now, just a little bit later on, if you even want to look at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul goes to speak about this in, in one of these kind of word pictures that we use often when we speak about uh, what it means to be the church. And he does this in 1 Corinthians 12, and it's down in verses 12 and 13. He says, for just as the body is one, and there he means the physical body, just as the physical body is one and has many members... Okay, so you've got arms and legs and hands and feet. And all the members are of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized, right? And the idea of baptized here in the history of, of the translation of the scripture, uh, the reason why we have the word baptized is because it was too controversial to translate the Greek word for baptize, and so we just got a loan word from Greek. Baptizo becomes baptize. Baptisma becomes baptism. And the reason why we did that, because it was such a controversial issue about that, they decided not to translate it so they wouldn't prejudice their translations for any one particular group. But the word baptize means to be put into, right? To be put into, right? So it's the idea that when you come up here uh, and uh, underneath there is the little trap door where we have the jacuzzi bath right here. No, actually the baptismal right up here is where you come up and see that. It's the reason why when somebody is baptized, we put them into the water, right? 
to symbolize what happened that you were put by the Spirit in a real but mystical way in union with Jesus Christ so that you're united to him and that all of us who have believed in Jesus Christ are therefore united to each other. And so we've mentioned this over and over uh, here at Emmanuel, the bonds that exist between every one of us who believe in Jesus Christ are more real, more eternal, more profound than they are between us and any one of our closest blood relatives who rejects Jesus. Okay. Sometimes that cuts right into our home because uh, a wife believes in Jesus and her husband doesn't. The parents believe in Jesus and their children don't. The children believe in, in Jesus, but the parents don't. Right? So the issue here is that we're united to Christ, and so we're coming to recall that. So everyone who trusts in Christ for their salvation is united with Christ and each other by a work of the Spirit. The Spirit unites us together with Christ in such a real and profound way that what Christ is Christ becomes ours. Okay? This, is, this is a profound truth. Uh, I know I've mentioned this to you before. One of the, the phrases that has come to impact, I even prayed it this morning before we came out this morning, is the difficulty with us as Christians is I don't need more money. I don't need better health. I don't need uh, a better wife or she needs a better husband, right? That could always happen, but it's not that the issue here, right? It's not that I need my kids to always obey. What we desperately need as Christians is a deeper, more profound appreciation of everything we already have. Everything we already have. We have all of God's riches in Christ Jesus. We just keep thinking if my boss was better, if my husband would just, you know, pick up his daggone stuff from the floor, right? Uh, if my roommate would stop dropping globs of toothpaste in the sink, right, and get the hair out of it, right, whatever, right, if they just do those things, then, then my life would be good. And what God is saying, wait, 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 you have everything, Live out of your abundance today. Live out of the fullness that you have and rejoice in that. Even in your worst day, all of the worst things have been taken out of your future and all the good things are yours. So the issue here is that we're united with him. We're united to each other. So when we come to remember in biblical terminology, this is not equivalent, right? Uh, if you, on a website, you'll say, have you ever seen those little things, this day in history, Right? And if you're like me, most of the time, it's this day is history. It's like a little tile, tile, and it says, this day in history, so-and-so was born. This day in history, I think this past week was uh, Ronald Reagan's birthday and a bunch of other people. You, you see these things, and I see them for a moment, and you recall them, but then I just pass right by them unless it's interesting to me. So in terms of remembering it, really all I've done is it's been brought to my mind, but it really didn't do anything to me by remembering it, right? So in the same way, and I know I've mentioned this to you as I grew up in the church, and I say this to you as young people, um, it was an elaborate thing in the church that I grew up in, and it was a whole day affair for my mom and dad to prepare for it. And uh, I, it was just like, a, you know, a big uh, event in my home. Uh, but for me as a kid, especially when I was younger, I was there and I thought, well, I'm going to get a little tasty grape juice, and I'm going to get a little wafer, right? I thought it was a pretty thin meal altogether, but I like both of them. Right? And so I was there, kind of busy, excited about those kind of events, but I was completely detached from the significance of what was happening in terms of that moment. Right? My mom and dad didn't want to be embarrassed by me running around and drinking you know, the, wine, the, uh, the uh, grape juice cups that were not drank. Right? So no, you can't do that, Greg. We don't need you to go empty all the glasses right? or to pick up the extra little bread. And they made actually unleavened bread, which was like a soft little cracker that they would make to break the bread. But, I, but we were there remembering Christ, but I wasn't. And then even as I grew up and I became a follower of Christ, sometimes I would sit here, and if I was honest about it, my only thought was, could the ushers please move faster? All right, please, could you guys move faster? And, you know, please stop taking so much time to get your, your cups out of the thing, please, right? You family, right, that has 30 people sitting there, please help the children, get it out, All right? Do whatever you want to do, but come on. Oh, that's not, that's not remembering. I was sitting there, I wanted to get it through, and, and it was like a ritual that we went through, and it came out at the end, and I thought, well, okay, what did we really do at that moment? And so this kind of memory is if you think in the best, this is the kind of memory that you see with a couple who want to celebrate their anniversary, who love each other and take their relationship seriously. So they pull aside from their normal activities in life. They pull aside from their normal activities because they don't want any distractions. They want to just focus in 
on their relationship with each other. They want to evaluate how things are going. They want to celebrate the good times. They want to look back over God's blessings in their life. They want to look back over the hard times and how God has been faithful. They want to review the commitments that they made to each other. When's the last time you as a married couple ever, and you know, I'd encourage you to do that. I have this happen to me all the time because I do a lot of weddings. But I would encourage you to pull out your wedding vows and read them. Right? Now, I, I get to say them to other people all the time, but God has just this nasty you know, tendency just to convict me when I'm reading vows for other people. Right? I say, God, that's for them. Right? I'm reading it for him to say right now. God says, well, how about you and Rana? And so it's one of those type of things. So here's what we're doing here as the people of God. We're pulling aside. We're setting aside on our calendar. We don't have any other priorities today other than just to sit here and reflect on the death of Jesus. And we're coming here to take back into that. And we're reminding ourselves of who we were. We're reminding ourselves of who Christ is. We're reminding ourselves of what he did. We're reminding ourselves of our new identity. We're reminding ourselves of who he's called us to be and our mission in the world. Right, so we're, we're, taking, we're going back into the event in order to let the event recalibrate us, change us, affect us deeply. And I, I would say to you, and this is why we give an opportunity, this is a spiritual endeavor. This is something that, that the scriptures make very clear that you're going to need the Spirit's help to help you to step back into the story that is the real story that explains all of our stories and the story that the only way to truly live out life is to walk with Jesus. It's going to take you back into that, and you're going to need God's help to do that. So we're coming here, and if you're looking at your first uh, set of blanks in your notes, if you want to fill those out, right? If you're one of those people that says, you've given me blanks, please don't finish the sermon without filling them in, right? So let me fill them in for you, these first group, right? So we're coming to remember, we come to be brought back into the story of God's wonderful deliverance. That's our first term, Wonder, wonderful deliverance in Christ, what he delivered us from, right? We talk about people being saved. Saved from what? Delivered from what is the term. So we're going to talk about that. We recall, this is our second statement, we, call, we recall the story to, here's a term that you probably don't use often, shudder at what we could have been shudder at what we could have been and then thirdly we re recall the story to rejoice together in God's gracious deliverance to rejoice and then finally we recall the story to remember who we are and who we are called to be okay so our four statements we come to be brought back into the story of God's wonderful deliverance in Christ we recall the story to shudder at what we could have been we recall the story to rejoice together in God's gracious deliverance. And we recall the story to remember who we are, our identity, and who we are called to be. Now, there's a ton of things that we could recall, but we're going to take Paul's cue, and we're only going to celebrate three of them. And we're not even going to be able to do them justice today. But we're going re to celebrate three things that have become ours because we are united with Christ. Okay, And he's going to be righteousness Christ is our righteousness Christ is our holiness and Christ is our redemption those are the three and we're going to look at them from a passage in first Corinthians Paul actually mentions them twice in first Corinthians he mentions them in chapter 1 verses 30 and 31 and then he returns to the same three in chapter 6 and verse 11 okay now uh, let's read this section here and this is my translation and amplified version right, to, for you to carry away uh, today, and, and, and if anything, I want to make sure that you understand the flow of thought and the issues that are uh, given here, okay? So here's verse 26 down through verse 31, and this is for 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's take just a moment and reflect on God's call to us. When you do, brothers and sisters, you can understand what I'm talking about. Recognize that not many of you are wise by the world's standards. Not many are powerful. Not many are nobility. On the contrary, God chose those the world thinks are foolish to humiliate those the world thinks are wise. And God, he chose 
those the world thinks are weak to humiliate the powerful. And God chose the undignified and despised people, this is a very interesting phrase, the nothings, to show the powerless of those, uh, of, uh, powerlessness of those the world admires. God intended to give no room for anyone who trusts in human wisdom and strength to boast in his sight. Rather, everything you have comes from God through Christ Jesus. Christ's death showed us God's wisdom that provides for our salvation. It is our relationship with Christ that allows us to share in what Christ accomplished in his death. His righteousness provides for our acquittal before God. Acquittal is the term that says not guilty. Not guilty. His holiness allows us to draw near to God. His payment of the price necessary to buy us out of slavery to sin allowed us to escape the bondage of sin and freed us to serve him. This all simply backs up what Jeremiah, the passage that uh, Grayson read a little bit earlier, which Paul quotes here at the end, this simply backs up what Jeremiah says long ago, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Okay, three things, right? So if you're, you're filling out some blanks, you want some more blanks to fill out, here we go. Number one, we're going to come back to each one of these. Uh, in, our, in, our ser- in our series here, we're talking about God's wisdom, right? We're talking about the wisdom of God. And uh, we talk about, and I, I, forget to, I forgot to fill out two blanks, didn't I? I left two blanks empty. Back, back up to the first one, right? Because this is important, okay? It says here, reverential awe, when we talk about, you know, in the wisdom literature, the beginning and end of wisdom is the fear of who? God, the beginning and ending of wisdom, right? And we define wisdom as reverential awe of recognizing really who is the authority in life because he's creator and redeemer and who we need to revere. And reverential is the idea that, that we give him worship. We respond to him in a way that's appropriate for his character and his place in the world, right? He's the one that gave existence to everything. He's the one that sustains everything. He's the one that's taking everything to the goal for which he's made it. He created everyone in this room and knows how you're supposed to function because he created you to function in a particular way, to be in a particular relationship with him. He's the one that knows how he made you to relate to each other. So he's the one that tells you to love your neighbor. And so we come with reverential awe, right? This God is great and huge and big. He's awesome in love and awesome in greatness. And so a reverential awe at the love of God poured out on us in Christ. Now, as we come to the New Testament, on the love of God poured out by the Spirit is the beginning and end of wisdom. Okay. So how are you going to be moved out of the camp of the fools? And the fools, biblically, is the fool says in their heart, there is no God. Right? The fool says in their heart, there is no God. There is no God. There's no one that I'm accountable to. There's no one who made me. There's not a purpose and direction in life. Right? Life is only what I make it. And matter of fact, in the present moment, I make up my world in my own mind. If I want to be female, I'm female. If I want to be something else, I'm that. And you can't tell me that that's not the case because the world is created in my own mind. I'm the creator of my world. Right? Well, Scripture says, well, the fool is the one who says there is no God, there is no designer, there is no creator, there is no redeemer, and so they set off on their own. That's the fool. So to move from that camp into those who are wise is to move to the camp where you recognize, number one, you are a fool. That's hard to take. There's a lot of people who are passing out wisdom today. You You can go on Instagram, any place you want to go, and everybody will tell you how to have a great life, how to look great, smell great, eat great right? Um, Experience all the great things, give you all kinds of little quotable quotes on how to live your life, right? To pick you up on a bad day, right? To help you to rejoice in a good day, all those kind of things. There's a lot of little trinkets out there, but apart from a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, there's not going to be the direction, the enablement, the ability to truly live. That's the biblical wager, So the idea here is it comes clear in Scripture, reverential awe, the love of God poured out on us in Christ by the Spirit is the beginning and end of wisdom. So the beginning of life, of genuine life, is bowing the knee and recognizing that God's wisdom and power is displayed in Jesus. And if I truly want to understand who I am and what life is about, 
I need a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where wisdom begins. And then all of life is learning how to walk with him so that his passions and priorities become more and more of who you are so that you grow in wisdom. And then when you're fully conformed to the person that God created you to be, it'll be, it'll be, you'll be able fully to truly uh, engage in the worship and service of God that you were created for. It's the beginning and end of wisdom. So we come to celebrate what God has done to reclaim rebels and to bring us to life, to reclaim fools and bring us to our senses. So let's talk about three things then. Now we come back. I filled in the blanks. Chris Smith is happy right over here. I was causing tension in him this morning. All right, so let's come. God's wisdom, first one, God's wisdom is on display when we understand that Jesus died, and here's a little phrase, to allow us to escape the punishment we deserve. That Jesus died to allow us to escape the punishment we deserve. And this is what Paul, when he talks about that Jesus is our righteousness, what he's referring to there is not, a, not an ethical quality of us, like that person is righteous or that person is, is a person who does right things, if you will. It's talking about our standing before God, that formally, because we were rebels, we had sinned against God, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Because we were that, we were, we were guilty at the bar of God's justice, right? We had sinned against God, and the core issue is that we had walked our own way, and right? We talked about what happened in the biblical storyline when Adam and Eve decided, you know, God, I don't need you. I don't need you to under, help me understand who I am. I don't need you to guide my life. I don't need you to, to, to be in relationship with you. I don't need that. I can figure it out on my own, and I can walk away from you. It took us out into a broken existence that robbed us of, of, the, of our identity and of the potential of our life. In God's mercy, he pursued us, Right, ultimately to the cross of Jesus and an empty tomb. Right? We went out into the wild. We, uh, we, we became wild ourselves, right? not only in the wild, but we became wild. And so here we were there not because we were broken. We were there because we were rebels. We were there because we just looked at God in the face and said, I don't need you and I don't want you and I'm going to walk away and I'm going to tell myself what's right and wrong. I'll make up my own mind. Me and Eve, we'll figure out how to, how to relate to each other. We don't need you to help us. And, of course, we see what happens quickly in the biblical storyline as Abel kills Cain, as Adam and Eve hide from one another in shame and fear, as they blame each other and turn on each other. They try to hide from God. All that immediately starts to become a part of what life in the wild is looking like, and Christ comes in to deliver us from the consequences of a rebellion and said, if I went to the cross and I died in your place... I took into myself, right? remember this phrase in 2 Corinthians 5, he became sin, meaning he became a sin offering. He took our rebellion on him so that I wouldn't have to pay the consequences. His righteousness, his status of being right with God was put on our account so that now I'm acquitted and I can stand in relationship with God. That's what we often refer to in scripture as justification. I'm righted with God. I have a standing with him. I'm no longer guilty before God. Now, the biblical story is the only person that you need to be concerned about being on the wrong side of is God. And now in Christ, we're acquitted. Okay? Acquitted. Okay, number two. Let's move on. Number two, he says, he is our holiness. Okay? Now, when we talk about Christ being our holiness here, is the idea behind holiness here is this holiness allows us to be brought into an intimate relationship with God, okay? We're set apart. So the issue is we're set apart. The two kind of ideas in holiness, we're set apart from what we used to be, our old identity, and now we're consecrated to him, right? Um, Paul says flesh and blood, right? People who haven't been transformed, they can't enter the kingdom. They can't come under God's rule. They can't know his blessing, right? So you have to be transformed. So now we've been made holy. This is why scripture can refer to people who believed in Jesus and say, you're saints. And they're referring to the idea that now you are in a relationship with God. You have access to him. Right? You can go to God in prayer. You have an intimacy with God that's available to you because of Christ. He is our holiness that allows us to stand in the presence 
right? The writer of Hebrews says, without holiness, no one could stand before God or in the presence of God. Well, whose holiness do we stand in? We stand in the holiness of Jesus. But now I have access to the Father. I'm welcomed into that presence because he's my holiness. He's my righteousness. He's my holiness, right? Now, we often use sanctification to refer to the process of growing in Christ or the idea of becoming more like Christ, what is possible by virtue of the fact that Christ is our holiness, right? But here Paul's not talking about that. He's talking about the fact, if I use this illustration, I know I've used it before, but when I was born into the Kowser family, I was a Kowser, right? And one of the things I never had any worried about, worries about is that my family was going to disown me, okay? And in some sense, they never could really disown me because I was a Kowser, right? Whether they wanted to or not, right? But I always knew from my mom and dad that they were never going to disown me. But that didn't mean I lived like a Kowser in their minds, right? There was a lot of un like behavior in my life, right? And so for many of us who have come to know Christ, we've come to know him, we've believed on him, but we're still struggling with our sin, right? One day, he's going to take care of all of that. But right now, today, you still struggle with lust and envy and pride, with elevating yourself above God and his purposes, right? With wanting your spouse to be what you want them to be instead of what Christ wants them to be. Finding your identity in your kids instead of trying to love your kids to Jesus. We do all those kind of things because we're on the way people. And so we're becoming, right? And I was growing up in my home with my family. My mom and dad were, were busy trying to teach me and discipline me to reflect the character that they wanted me as a Kowser to reflect, right? When I didn't reflect Kowser-like character, I got discipline. Depending on how egregious it was, it could have been all kinds of different ones. It could have been a talking to, right? Uh, I don't know if I had timeouts back then. I don't know if that, they had such a thing as timeout. I just had a, a talking to or some sort of uh, physical encouragement, uh, right? Uh, something along those lines. My, my mom was the wielder of the ruler. We had this big 36-inch uh, yardstick that she kept in the central closet there in the middle of the room. She's probably listening online today so she can hear this. And uh, I didn't really fear that too much, but I really feared my dad when he would do that, right? Um, but they were trying to love me into my identity, Right? They weren't, weren't saying, you're not a Kowser yet, and you need to become one. No, they were saying, no, you are my son, and because of this, I want you to grow into your identity. Right? You're a child of God. He wants you to grow into your identity, but you stand in an intimate relationship with God because of his holiness. So God's wisdom is on display when we understand that Jesus died to bring us close to himself. Do right? you think about that? It was, it was a while ago that um, I don't know what happened in terms of my prayer life or different things. I often think about Jesus as a historical person. I think about Jesus as uh, the son of God who did these things on the cross. But I just had an awakening to the idea that, that Jesus is, is ruling and reigning. He is active today. And today is a day to get up and say, Greg, Greg, come on. We got things to do. I'm on mission today. You're my child. I want you in intimate, close relationship with me. Turn to your words so that you can hear me speak to you today and remind me of your identity and who you are. Get on your knees in prayer and talk to me today because I want you to engage with me in relationship today. Gather around my people so they can remind you of who you are and what really matters. God, let's let's go, Greg, today. Not this Christ who came and the Christ who's coming, but the Christ who's presently ruling and reigning and the head of his church, me, And all of us gathered here today are doing his work by his spirit today. But he wants you in an intimate, close relationship with you. He doesn't want you going through rituals. He doesn't want you to be singing songs that you're not really reflecting on what they say about your relationship with Jesus. He doesn't want you to wait until you come to church to have someone to prompt you to do that any more than your wife is waiting for you once a week or your best friend is waiting for you once a week to acknowledge them and have a conversation. And so he brought us close to him. So the second thing, he's become our righteousness, he's become our holiness. And then thirdly, the last one, God's wisdom is on display when we understand that Jesus died to free us, to free us to find the life he wants to give us, to free us to find the life he wants to give us, right? 
Now, this is the, the, the idea of redemption. He's become our redemption, right? That, that is a, 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 a picture, a word picture that's drawn from the first century of, of buying the freedom of a slave, right? The term is manumission, right? To free them by paying the price necessary to secure their freedom, right? And the, the metaphor, the word picture is Christ came and given the sin that we had committed, right? That what happened when we sinned against God, not only did we uh, incur justly his wrath against us, but we had chosen a new master, right? We had freed ourselves from God and enslaved ourselves to sin. And now we're under sin slavery. We've got satanic oppression, sin slavery, darkness within, darkness without. That's who we were, right? Paul's going to say in Romans chapter 8, we couldn't do the will of God from the heart. We couldn't live to him because we didn't want to because we were enslaved to sin and we were in willing league with the evil one and his intentions to stand over against God and all of his purposes. That's who we were. We were in bondage to that. Well, Christ comes and he pays the price that's necessary to free us from the bondage of sin so that to use our picture to be brought out of the wild and be brought back to our senses. To be brought out of the wild and brought back to our senses. And all of us know the sting of sin. We know the impact that sin has that robs us of life, robs us of relationships, robs us of our purity, robs us of um, our joy because it floods guilt in on top of us. Diminishes our ability to understand who we are and what God's called us to be. But Christ has made us free. So I want you to turn over here. One other passage. Look over at Galatians chapter 5 with me for a moment. Galatians chapter 5. Okay. So he's become our righteousness. We're acquitted, right? Not guilty. Second, he's become uh, our holiness. Come to me. Come to me. Intimate relationship with him. And then third... He's become our redemption. And he says, you're free. Right? And so Paul says to the Galatians, it is for freedom, verse 1, that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So we come to celebrate today the fact that Christ has made us free. We don't have to submit to sin's bondage. We can serve God from the heart. We can, Romans chapter 6, we can submit every aspect of our being to do God's work from the heart. We have freedom today, and we have responsibility today to use that freedom. And what Paul's encouraging the Galatians to say, don't go back into the bondage that the world's trying to invite you in to think that you can fix yourself. That's bondage. That's bondage. You can't fix yourself. You can't save yourself. You can't get yourself out of this mess. You can't find some other means to live your life other than Jesus. Don't go back in that bondage. Because you go back in that bondage, you're going to find destruction and relational destruction and hatred and sexual debauchery. You go back in that direction where you go. But the fruit of the Spirit, the path of freedom is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. We're free to be kind people. We're free to be patient with one another. We're free to love generously. We're free to harness our sexual desires to know God's blessing. We're free to serve him and love people. That's something we come to celebrate today. We're free. Don't compromise your freedom. So Christ is the wisdom and power of God. Why, why the wisdom and power? He's the only one able to deliver us from the things that truly threaten us. And he's the only path that you can follow to find genuine life. The wisdom and power of God. And just three things, right? He's our righteousness. He's our holiness. He's our acquittal. He's the one that allows us intimacy with God. And he's our redemption. He's the one that frees us from the bondage of sin. I don't have to sin today. I can choose to. I don't have to be an idiot with my wife. I can choose to. I don't have to neglect my neighbor. I can choose to. On the other hand, 
I can be an instrument in the life of my wife to help her understand a little bit more of who Jesus is and what he's done and make her make by God's grace Jesus more attractive to her for her blessings so that she can follow him and love him and trust him. Or I can be a barrier that she has to climb over to get to Jesus. I'd rather be the former rather than the latter. So Paul ends with where let's boast in Jesus. Right, let's boast in him. Let's trust him to follow him as the wisdom and power of God for life now and to come. Let's enjoy our acquittal before the bar of God's justice because Christ is our righteousness. Paul, Paul is so excited about this reality, right? Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, he put it down. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And then later on in that same chapter, he goes, if God is for you, it doesn't make any difference who's against you, right? But the flip side of that is, if God isn't for you, it doesn't make any difference who is. But in Christ, there's no condemnation, right? That's incredible. No condemnation. Let's marvel at and take advantage of the intimacy we have with God through Christ. You know, I, I prayed this week, one of my favorite prayers is in Ephesians chapter 3, and I prayed this, uh, this week in particular. I just had a malaise this week, a, a kind of a boredom, a, a kind of a, a drifting and Paul's prayer in, in Ephesians chapter 3 is, Lord, right about verse 15, Lord, please, by your spirit, would you open the eyes of the hearts of these people to be able to realize what it means that they have been loved by Jesus? Would you do a work of spirit so that they could understand its height and its width and its length and its breadth so that they could be rooted and grounded in his love? And so that then they would be prepared with all of God's people to join in together to explore uh, the, the riches of Christ's love until, until Christ, you, you've come and filled them up. So they think like you do, they view life like you do, they delight in the will of the Father the way you do, Lord, so that your people might enjoy the life that you've given them. That's the kind of intimacy he wants us to know. And then finally, and let's declare... Right? I, I say this to Claire. There is no sin that halves you if you're a follower of Christ that you don't have the resources in Christ with the help of God's people to say no to. Amen? Amen. There's no sin that has you. I don't care how hard it's been. I don't care how long it's been. The power of Christ that raised him from the dead can free you. It can free you. May not be like that. But every day, leaning on Christ, Christ, you have given me that. I don't have to go there on my computer. I don't have to go back to that substance again to try to make it today. I don't have to unleash that string of profanity today when something goes wrong and just blister the people in my life. I don't have to take it out on my kids and family. No, that's not legitimate. I don't have to do that. I don't have to fear in, in, in integrating in the body of Christ and talking to people. God, I need to stand here because I trust you that mixing, you know, uh, mixing it up with this broken group of people is the place where you want to change me and grow me. So God, you can give me enough strength not to bail out on people and run. There's no excuse by God's grace. And because God's saying, no, no, no. The reason why I'm giving you that power because I want you to know life. I'm not here to sit here and beat you over the head. You could have done otherwise as if Jesus is the big scolder in the sky, right? No. So come on, you got the ability to come here. Enjoy what I want to give you. Come toward each other. Dad, you can speak differently to your son. Son and daughter, you can relate differently to your parents. There's no excuse. I don't care how old you are for disobeying and disrespecting your parents and treating them. God says, no, no, no. They've been put in your life for your blessing. You have the resources. I don't care if all of your peers are idiots. You don't have to be one. Right? And so let's declare and protect our freedom from sin's bondage that came at the cost of Christ's life. Your freedom came at the cross, at the cost of Christ's life. Let's, let's protect it. Let's fight for it. Let's fight for each other, right? 
Men, let's fight for each other to love our wives well. Let's fight for each other to represent Christ at our jobs well. Let's fight for each other to stand in there and be the dads that we need to be. Let's fight for each other for the purity of our hearts and for lives that matter that aren't squandered on things that don't matter. Right? Let's fight for it because we have the freedom in Christ to do that. Right? Let us be free. Right? Today, God help us. All right, I'm going to ask Grayson to come, and I'm going to pray here. And uh, Grayson's going to come, and we're going to take our communion. So as we remember Christ, right, we're going to remember who we are, what he's done. And we want to savor the good things that God has done, and we want to reaffirm our commitment to him, right? And also it's a time, as Paul encourages us in 1 Corinthians 11, he says it's a time always when you come to reflect on who you are and how you're doing. Right now, we need to take a moment. And we're just going to give you some time. Grayson's going to play. And, and I want to encourage you just to sit there and celebrate in, some, in your quiet time and say, God, thank you for what you've done. God, please, by your spirit, would you take me back into the realities of what you have done for me? Because, Lord, if I'm honest, they're just not things that really stir me up. Because would you do that for me, please, God? Would you, would you if, if need be, would you bring tears to my eyes? Would you, would you give me just a, a hitch in my soul that just gets me inside of that truth, like those moments when you wake up and recognize something that's really good and true? And then secondly, God, would you see if there's anything in me right now that's inconsistent with who you've made me to be and what you've called me to be? Because God, I know you want to love me away from that, and God, give me the strength to recognize it and to confess it and turn from it. So let's do that together uh, as we uh, have a moment of reflection, and then we'll move on from there. Grayson.